So last year we were um, approached by Randy and she asked us if, we were, if we'd be interested in creating a curriculum for kids based on um, the Dalai Lama's book, Ethics for the New Millennium. Uh, we were interested and little did we know that we'd end up um, in India in March spending time with students from Nigeria and from Tibet and meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, a lot of what we've, what we've been doing is sending our experiences back uh, via a blog that we've been keeping. And ultimately, we hope to end up with a guidebook to hap or for happiness to help students uh, find their own definition and discover happiness, lasting happiness. Mm -hmm. And also uh, some kind of web component that's interactive and, um, and compelling to students. So we can jump right into questions, I think. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mr. Lucas. Um, the coming of age archetype, I've noticed, is really prevalent in your films. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, why is this important to you? Well, um, one of the greatest decisions you can make in your life is what you're going to do with it. And obviously, coming of age is that point where you're transitioning from being taken care of to taking care of yourself, and uh, um, where you are beginning to become responsible for your own actions. Um, so it's a crucial period. and. It's a uh, period where if you make a mistake, it's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Um, hi, I'm Luke. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> um, at Mount Madonna, we put on a production of the Ramayana every year. And mm -hmm. we've been doing it for about 30 years now, so it's quite a long time. And um, when we're on stage, we can kind of put our own spirituality into the characters because they're so archetypical. And um, I was just wondering, how did you put your own spirituality into your films? And, and even did you put your own spirituality, or was it just uh, something that came to you creatively? Well, creatively or spiritually or intellectually, um, you are your work, which is it's very hard to separate the artist from what he does, uh, uh, no matter who it is or what they're doing, um, because the you know, your creativity is so interconnected with your inner being that it reflects you as a person. So if you want to know a person, uh, a filmmaker, or uh, even any kind of artist really, but as, especially a filmmaker, you can sort of understand a lot about them just by looking at their work and you can understand what kind of a person they are. Thank you. Hi, I'm Madeline. Hi. In Project Happiness, we are exploring the difference between short and long-term happiness. What do you think are the things which most contribute to long-term happiness? Well, my theory of short and long-term happiness is a broader definition, which has to do with uh, pleasure and joy. Happiness is the result of a combination of pleasure and joy. Short-term happiness, which you could call pleasure, um, and then long-term happiness, which you can call joy. Short-term happiness, which is pleasure, is uh, self-centered. It's all about getting something. It's all about getting pleasure. Uh, and so uh, it's by its very nature short-term. And it's by its very nature, it's additive, which means that if you do something once, say you buy a car, the first car you buy is fantastic. It's an amazing experience. You get this thing. The second time you buy a car, it's not so amazing. So you have to buy a bigger, fancier car in order to get the same experience as when you bought your first car. And it just keeps going down until you have you know, six yachts, 12 airplanes, and uh, 50 cars. <laughs> and even then, that experience with those will not equal the first experience you had. So trying to extend ha uh, pleasure into a long-term relationship thing won't work. It just can't. Pleasure cannot, by its very nature, be long-term, short-term. And, you know, it's a little spike that goes through your life and it makes things better and there's nothing wrong with pleasure, good meal, uh, you know, whatever. But um, joy is, is different. Joy, once you have joy, it lasts forever. Uh, it doesn't hit as high on the scale as pleasure does. Pleasure will go way up there, but only for a few minutes or maybe for a few hours or maybe for a few days. But joy um, goes uh, on a lower scale, but it will last forever. And joy is as the opposite of the passion of, of uh, and the self-centeredness of pleasure is 
compassion, giving, uh, helping other people. Um, the uh, uh, issue of joy uh, really has to do with taking care of other people and doing things for others rather than for yourself. Whereas joy, it's all for yourself and not for others. And, that's, and those two things combined make happiness, um, which is also a mental state, which you can either decide you're happy or you're not. So, but the biological reality is uh, that uh, you have these two components, pleasure and joy. Hi, yes. I'm Nina. <laughs> um, in the filmmaking industry, you're truly a revolutionary. Your films have young people rebelling against authority and asserting their independence. Um, I was wondering, when we mature and get older and successful in life, how do we maintain a healthy spirit of newness and avoid becoming the things that we struggled against? Um, that's a big challenge. <laughs> uh, you, you are fighting upstream when you're trying to uh, you know, break away, and when you're trying to, uh, uh, you know, create your own identity, and when you're trying to do new things, um, no matter how you do it, um, uh, eventually, uh, if you're successful, you find yourself uh, part of the establishment, and you find yourself becoming uh, the very thing you've been fighting against. Uh, then you're real challenge is to keep your ideals so that you can actually change the system uh, once you, you're successful, um, like you've been trying to do as you work your way up through the system. Uh, but you'll find that, uh, generally speaking, when you're young and idealistic and you see wrongs and you see things that don't work and you see um, uh, endless stupidity, which you'll come across, um, <laughs> it is... Um, a good and uh, a good thing to fight it, and you'll find if you fight it, you do good at what you do, and if you do what, good at what you do, then you'll become successful. What are some of those ideals that you've kept? Well, um, in um, uh, I guess probably the oddest thing you would find is that when I got involved in film, I didn't know anything about film, and I just got involved, and I fell in love with it. I loved it, and I wanted to create stories and do things. And I never had any intention, really, of becoming successful or making money or doing anything. I wanted to make movies. So all my decisions were about making my movies, not becoming successful. I became successful primarily because I wanted to control the content of my movies, and I didn't want other people to tell me how to make movies or to have to uh, sort of worked very hard on somebody else's message. So everything I did, I did really to gain control over my work. But as a result of that, um, my ideas about what constituted a good movie and the messages that I wanted to send out there and those sort of things became very popular and as a result I became very successful. But if I'd have gone down another road and just been a work for hire at a studio, I probably would never have been successful. You know, if I'd have just sold out. And, and there was points in my life where I was absolute broke, uh, in debt, offered hundreds of thousands of dollars to work in Hollywood and refused to do it. So having come back from India and working on this curriculum, we feel like we have a story to tell and we have a message to share. And throughout your career, we've noticed that you've had some stories to tell and some messages to share, and I'm curious what obstacles you've run into and how you've overcome, um, overcome them. Uh, well, I've run into hundreds and hundreds of obstacles. <laughs> and um, you overcome them with just sheer persistence and belief in yourself. Um, it's not much else to it. Uh, you work hard to be as um, capable as possible. Uh, you work to uh, exploit your talent that we all have. Uh, part of that is knowing yourself and knowing what you're talented at. I was very, very, very fortunate in that um, I discovered my talent by happenstance. Uh, I was interested in being an illustrator. 
Uh, I liked building things. I wanted to race cars for a long time. I built cars. Um, and I wanted to be an architect. Uh, I wanted to be an anthropologist. I studied anthropology for a long time. Um, and I liked photography. And all those things came together when I discovered that there was actually a place where you could go to make movies. Um, and I didn't really intend, I was going to the University of Southern California and I just sort of picked that major because it was something I was interested in. Um, otherwise I was going to go to San Francisco State and actually become, study anthropology. And um, so it was just a fluke that got me there. Uh, when I got there, there was nobody in the film schools, which is I think one of the reasons I got in because they were extremely small, <laughs> extremely unpopular. The people that went there were the the uh, uh, sort of uh, antique version of geeks. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they were all bearded and strange and weird. And, um, uh, and um, so everybody would say, well, why are you becoming a cinema major? You can't get a job. Because you can't. There was absolutely no way to get a job if you went to film school. Nobody had ever gone from film school and actually gotten a job. Uh, you could be a ticket taker at Disneyland. <laughs> you maybe could do some educational films, maybe work for Boeing or somebody like that doing industrial films, but you wouldn't get into the actual film business. So when I went in and I discovered that I loved this, I said, well, okay, um, I don't really want to go into the, the theatrical film business anyway. I want to be a documentary filmmaker, uh, although there was absolutely no documentary filmmaking in this country. Uh, there was no place to show documentary films on television or anywhere else. Um, so that was a pretty hopeless exercise. Um, and, uh, but I decided that I loved it so much and everybody there at school, there were only about maybe 150 of us, um, loved it. That's the only reason we were there is we loved film and that's all we ever wanted to do. As it turned out, and, and everything was stacked against us, and, but I just went ahead, we went ahead anyway because we did what we loved. We didn't say, you know, my friend was a business major, I had another friend that was in law school, and I, my brother-in-law was a doctor that graduated from there. And they were all, you know, you're going to have no future. Um, and um, so uh, we just kept going, and it just happened that, uh, like everything in life, things change all the time, and the industry grew. It just happened that at that particular time when I was graduating from college, which was, um, you know, in the 60s, uh, all the people who uh, were in the film business and it started out in 1910 were now retiring. Not just one or two, but all of them. And they were the ones that held the keys and they were the ones that only let their relatives in and they were the ones. So corporations bought up the studios, corporations, and said, well, we have to get people to run these things, so we'll hire people that are schooled in this sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so fortunately, we got. You know, I got sort of uh, roped into it, even though that wasn't really where I was intending to go. Life is fluid. You're always given opportunities and choices. Um, uh, generally speaking, no choice, I mean, no decision is the worst decision. Because you always have these decisions to make. And, you know, if you go with your heart and do what you think is right, uh, generally it'll take you in the right place because as I say then you'll be doing things that you love and even if you're doing something that is you know you decide to be a gardener uh, and that's really what you want to do and that's what gives you pleasure then be a gardener even though your father and your friends may say why aren't you a lawyer because you can be a lawyer you got accepted to law school why you want to get be a gardener say well I like this you know you'll find that you'll be much happier um, because you know, and money can't buy you happiness. And that's been proven a million times. It can buy you pleasure. <laughs> but it's not gonna ever buy you happiness. And over time, not, you can't make enough money to buy you pleasure anymore because you need so much to keep you going. So it's better to get in there with joy because it doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've read that you grew up Methodist. But now that you're, now you're a Methodist Buddhist, is that correct? Well, that's what I tell my kids. <laughs> I'm curious as to uh, how you came to identify with the Buddhist religion, and also what the similarities are between the two of Methodism and... Well, when I was very young, I don't know, about 
eight or ten years old, somewhere in there. I can distinctly remember asking my mother, um, if there's one God, why are there so many religions? Um, and of course she couldn't answer that. Uh, and, um, but I think that question has always been very uh, relevant to my life. Um, because obviously if there's one God, then everybody's worshiping the same God, then everybody should be sort of the word of God, if there is a word of God, uh, would be the same. Um, but as you find, there's you know, hundreds of different interpretations of everything, um, which obviously means that that, in my mind, is not really the word of God, that's the word of man. And um, if you go beyond all the religions, because they're all similar, you know, they're all, I like to think of them as the blind men and the elephant. You know, each blind man goes up to the elephant, one hugs the leg and says it's a tree, the other uh, does the, uh, the uh, ear and says it's a leaf, and the other one says that it's a trunk and it's a snake. And, uh, you know, but they're all describing the same thing. So what you do is try to look for the, the unifying factors in all religions. Um, and um, so, uh, I became good friends with Joe Campbell, who's also, um, you know, looking at things from the anthropological side. I got involved with him in uh, my first introduction to him was in anthropology, in a class of mythology, and um, he tries to, you know, comparative mythology, which is to take all the mythology and try to find the similar factors that fall through and why people. Part of that is psychology, or the way, you know, I think of anthropology, or I think of mythology as sort of a a form of uh, psychological archaeology. You can go back and see what people were thinking 2,000, 3,000 years ago and what they were struggling with in terms of trying to form cultural um, boundaries in which to form a civilization um, and try to explain the mysteries that they find around them. Man has a very unique capacity in his imagination uh, and desire to know everything. <laughs> which is, you know, God gave us a brain. That's our, uh, that's our uh, stinger. That's our camouflage. That's our uh, uh, 800 pounds uh, that we can use to survive with. Um, and uh, the thing we need to do is to use that brain. And the more we use it, the more we learn things, the more we test those things, uh, the more we use, use those things in our daily life and pass them on to the next generation, the more we advance uh, and, uh, and are able to survive. Uh, so uh, when you look at the roots of everything and you look at what's kind of psychological and then what's the mystery, uh, man has always put the mystery um, Say, you know, the way you explain everything is you say, well, we know this, this is wood, and I know this came from a tree, but I don't know this over here. But we'll just say, well, that, that's God. So in the beginning, there was a lot of God and not much knowledge. <laughs> and now we have a tiny bit more knowledge. Uh, and we can go for another two or three million years probably before we even get a hint of whether there's any intelligent design or anything behind what happened. Um, but we won't know for a long time. And what we, it's very good that we take everything we don't understand and put it in that category. And it's our job, or it's God's will, for us to learn these things, learn the rules, learn the intelligent design. That's why we're here. But, uh, if we're uh, you know, made in his image, then the idea is that we have to learn everything that he knows, even though it takes millions of years. And we're just stumbling along one step at a time. So, um, in Star Wars, there's a very obvious theme of the apprentice and the mentor. And we know that for that movie, you were, um, in some sense, mentored by Joseph Campbell. And in this project, we really have an opportunity to pass on what we think is important to other kids our age. What ideas do you think it's important that we pass on to um, children going into adulthood? Well. The core thing to pass on is, you know, um, in talking about religion is, you know, all religions say one thing. 
basically, which is uh, love is a secret to the universe, which is compassion, which is love others, take care of others, help each other. Well, that's about all it comes down to. It's not very hard. It's hard to live by, but it's not very hard to know, and it's not very hard to realize that every single uh, prophet, every single religion, always comes down to the same thing. You know, you can take all the other things out of it because that's ultimately what it all comes down to is compassion. A quick thing about that. Was the Jedi, like the idea of the Jedi based on compassion or love or? Yeah, it's, it's based on compassion. And I mean, again, the, the, the force, the religion and everything is based on all religions. It's not just based on one. I mean, obviously there are heavy overtones in Eastern religion. Um, but, you know, it's half Methodist, half Buddhist. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, or, you know, half Christian, Judeo-Islamic Christian, which is one religion, and half Buddha, uh, which is in a different category. Uh, but when you go back, it's all the same anyway. So um, it's... Um, the, the, one of the core values, one of the big problems of the struggle in Star Wars is about um, uh, passion against compassion, which is greed against giving and giving up primarily. And the whole issue is the flip side of greed is fear of losing. So you're either trying to get things or you're afraid of losing the things that you've got. And the idea is that to let go of those things and uh, to, uh, because once you start down that path of fear, then you're trying to protect things and you're willing to fight for things and you're willing to, and the Jedi's basic job in the beginning, which we never get to see too much of because we start really during the war, the, they were like marshals in the old west. I mean, they would go from town to town and they would, uh, you know, uh, help solve the problems, and and uh, you know, in a lot of cases, the marshals and the judges were pretty much the same thing, and they would just travel, and they would bring uh, justice and solve problems for people, which is kind of what Jedi are, um, and they're negotiators; they're not fighters. Only they're negotiators, um, sort of like the mafia. <laughs> They're, 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 they're compassionate negotiators with a very big laser sword, <laughs> which they don't like to use, but if somebody, you know, uh, doesn't want to solve the problem, uh, then uh, they'll solve it for them, so to speak, which is a, an incentive for people to solve their problems without fighting. <laughs> um, but that's where all that comes from. Thank you. Uh, earlier you said that you can see a lot about a person in their art. And I was wondering, when you're working in a project, like with, for someone who has a greater vision, how do you keep your individuality in your art? Well, um, I believe in the artist. So, like, right now I'm working on Indiana Jones 4 with Steve Spielberg, but I'm letting uh, Steve pretty much make his movie. I mean, I've worked on it for 14 years to develop it and to get it going, but then I turn it over to him. And we discuss changes and things. And we have this relationship because he's also a producer. He also has the same situation. And um, when uh, we have a difference of opinion, I'm probably the only outside producer that's ever done films with Steven, except uh, on Jaws he had outside producers. But since he's, you know, since uh, Indiana Jones, he hasn't had outside producers. And, um, but when there's a disagreement, I just say, look, Steve, do it your way, it's your movie. And he'll say, no, 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 it's your movie, we'll do it your way. <laughs> so with that, we're able to reach a compromise. And ultimately what we decide is what is best, what is the best thing for the movie. And it just so happens that we agree, we have similar taste, we have similar ideas about what works and what doesn't, and there's a little area where we don't disagree. And you know, we kind of bounce against each other and try to reach a compromise. And hopefully out of that comes the best possible movie. Well, um, <laughs> when you were talking about this idea of pleasure and 
like it's it seemed almost like an addiction when you when you get the car and you can't get back to it. it just made me and then you were just talking about the dark side how once you start down that path you can't really uh, like go back is that the same way for this addiction to pleasure is yeah. is it is there is there no way of getting out of that dark side and if Ad not how do you get back pleasure is addictive a joy could be addictive too i mean it's not you know uh, I mean, again, it's a biological response. You know, you put on the pleasure pedal and it's great. Um, and I say, w the choice you have is to be um, on the pleasure pedal full bore with joy and tootle along at 35 miles an hour. But you're going to be able to go around the world 100 times. Or go on the nitrous oxide pleasure uh, pedal and push it as hard as you can and you can go 300 miles an hour but you're only going to go about a half a mile so if you say oh I'm going to go around the world several times on the pleasure pedal uh, because I'm addicted to that high I love that well the reality is it's not possible it's just the, it's, it's, you know, it's like saying I'm going to stop the sun from setting it just you can't do that I mean, you can pretend to do it, and you can say, you, you, once you get that addiction, then you're, you're on a treadmill that you can't win on. I mean, just like drugs. I mean, you have to take more, you have to keep taking more, your functionality goes down, uh, and you basically end up losing. No matter how you do it, you lose. And it's the same thing buying cars, or eating, or any other pleasure. If you say, I have to keep that pleasure level that high, and I'm addicted to it, and people are addicted to it. People get addicted to it, one thing or another. Uh, there are addictions of gambling, or I say eating, or uh, you know, buying things, or you know, there's a million things, you can, you know, pleasurable things you can get addicted to. Um, that just means that you're lost sight of reality. That you don't, you're lost sight of the fact that this is this is a nice moment, and then I have to learn to let it go. But if I, I'm afraid of letting it go, so I can't let it go then you're going to the dark side because your fear is that you can't have it anymore. And that has to do with relationships, that has to do with your, ultimately with your life. You, you sort of say, I want to do this, and, and, but you have to get self-disciplined enough to be able to say, that is not a good idea. That is not good for me. That isn't going to work. I'll enjoy the pleasure when it comes. I'll let it go when it's over. And I'll look forward to the next time I'm going to have some pleasure. But if you help somebody, uh, the greatest thing you can ever do is have kids. It's an interesting uh, reality of why we're here, that one of the greatest pleasures is making kids. One of the greatest joys, or the greatest joy, is raising kids. You will, and kids, kids, I say, children. <laughs> but children teach you compassion. It's an amazing thing about life, which is they come out, they're half an hour old, and they're already wiser than you are. <laughs> and what they know how to teach you is how to ha be, have unconditional love, how to be completely absorbed with another human being and devoted to that human being. And the joy you get from that. And if you say, gee, if I did this to everybody, if I treated everybody the way I treat my little six-week-old baby, then... Um, I would have a lot of joy. And you don't have to have babies to do it. You could be Sister Teresa. But, you know, that's the hard way. And you really have to have a lot of strength to be able to do something like that. The easy way is to have kids. <laughs> because they don't, you don't have a choice. You know, you have to love them because they're very cute. <laughs> until they turn into teenagers. And then this other, <laughs> this other miracle happens where when they're ready to leave and say, I'm out of here, I want to be independent, you know, they get all gawky and pimply and ugly. And they're not cute anymore, so the parents are just as willing to say, okay, go off, have your life. But that's a true miracle. I mean, how could you do that where, a ch you, like when they're children are their worst, like at two, at two years old, they're breaking away from you. Um, emotionally, they're really difficult. They're really you know, terrible twos. But you know, that's also the time, by some miracle, that they're the cutest. 
They are, you know, two and three year olds are absolutely adorable. And um, when you have kids, you'll understand what I'm talking about because you'll want to throttle them, but you won't uh, because, you know, you love them too much and they're too cute. But when they turn into teenagers and they do the same thing, you sort of aren't going to throttle them, but you're going to say, well, yeah, if you really want to go do that, go off, go to college, you know, go, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not going to hold you back. All right. I, that was a very long answer. For it. <laughs> and I'm really going to get in trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you.